Welcome back. We're talking with Dr. Junius P. Rodriguez, a professor of history at Eureka College, the uh, editor of the Encyclopedia of Slave Resistance and Rebellion, eureka.edu. And, of course, the book, you can find it uh, your favorite uh, source for books. It's published by Greenwood. And, uh, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm curious your take on uh, you, the argument that has been made. I, I don't know if you read it. I, I made it. Uh, Dr. Carl, or Professor Carl Bogus made it. Others have made it. Um, I was more quoting them. That uh, Patrick Henry and George Mason explicitly, and in fact, it's in the, it's in the record. I mean, <laughs> you can read their words, that they explicitly said that they wanted the Second Amendment to say free state rather than free country. Free country was the original draft that James Madison had put together because their state militias were in part part of the state security apparatus that maintained the institution of slavery in their state, and they were afraid that if that militia fell under federal control, that northern states, if they had emergencies, they could call the militia away from their state, which would leave them defenseless, or if the northern states took power over the federal government, and were hostile to slavery, they could basically disarm the militia by refusing to uh, apportion mo- funds for arming them. Um, are you familiar with that argument? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, I'm familiar with it. I, I would say this. There was some connection between uh, the role of the militias and maintain, maintaining order in slave societies. But keep in mind that the militias were separate from the slave patrols, and, and mm-hmm. much of this responsibility fell on the patrols. Right. So it would have been an extraordinary kind of circumstance where the militia would have had to be involved in this. Now, keep, keep in mind also that when we're talking about the colonial period, there were a lot of dangerous potential situations that could arise, uh, slave resistance being one of those. Uh, there were a lot of indigenous uh, tribal peoples who might be uh, potentially uh, threatening some of the settlements, in Mm -hmm. in particular as you got into the mountain regions. Uh, On top of that, keep in mind that there really is sort of an economic and class divide that we find in uh, in colonial America and and even into the early republic, where, uh, let's say, something like Bacon's Rebellion or Shea's Rebellion comes along. Uh, what you're going to have is individuals who seem to be out of the loop of sorts in terms of the social order and the economic order challenging the power of the day. And so what you see happening oftentimes is the militia sometimes is going to be used against fellow citizens who seem to be uh, the poorer sort. Mm-hmm. And, and it's interesting with, uh, with Bacon's Rebellion, for example, you actually do have some slaves and some indentured servants who do join that particular uh, campaign against the power of uh, the the royal power of the Virginia colony at the time, mm-hmm. and and yet uh, Patrick Henry in in the in the ratifying convention, his objection, he said, uh, and I quote: "In this state, there are two hundred and thirty six thousand blacks, and there are many in several other states, but there are few or none in the northern states. May Congress not say that every black man must fight?" Did we, uh, did we not see a little act of this in the last war? We were not so hard pushed as to make emancipation general, but acts of assembly passed that every slave would go into the army should be free. He was objecting to Article One, Section 8 of the, of the Constitution. He said, if the country be invaded, a state may go to war, but cannot suppress slave insurrections under this new Constitution. If there should happen an insurrection of slaves, the country cannot be said to be invaded. They cannot, therefore, suppress it without the interposition of Congress, Congress and Congress only, under this proposed Constitution, can call forth the militia. What does that mean to you? One of the things that does come to mind is an effort to make sure that there would be a rather strong Southern interest in the powers of the new government, the powers of the Congress. Mm-hmm. And there, there are some who, in the, uh, in the early federal period, do start talking about a slave power conspiracy, the, the idea that somehow powers that were created in, in the Constitution specifically granted uh, more power, in effect, to some of the southern states and than, than if you look at who was elected president in the early years. That, you know, many, many southerners were elected. Yeah, a lot of Virginians. Who was serving on the Supreme Court, who was serving as Speaker of the House. 
right. uh, a, a lot of the powerful cabinet level positions. But I, I think we also have to factor in that one of the great debates that existed then, and, and to a certain degree exists even to this day, is how we look at state powers compared to the power of, of the national government. And there were a lot of individuals, in particular among the anti-federalist crowd, there were a lot of individuals who were quite leery of centralized power in the national government at the time. Sure. And I, I think it's safe, safe to say that even today we find individuals and in, in various political groups who might share some of those sympathies. But I, I wonder, and, and I don't claim a particular expertise on this, but I wonder if the concern about making sure that the word state is specifically used was because they recognized or, or they felt that the power of the state at the time should truly be supreme to any power, any type of uh, interposition authority that, that the uh, national government might have. Mm-hmm. And so they wanted to make sure that it was explicitly clear that this power was granted to states. Kind of an extension of the Tenth Amendment, or at uh, least true. that logic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and did any of this, and, and also during the Revolutionary War, I mean, the British had used slaves against the southern states in, in as much as they offered freedom to any southern African American who, who defected to the British side. That's, that's true. We, we first saw that in uh, November of 1775, Lord Dunmore, yes. the last royal governor of Virginia, uh, had issued a proclamation in, in which... Those individuals who were uh, who were enslaved, if they were willing to leave their plantations and farms and uh, go to the British lines and, and serve, you know, w- within uh, British forces. So between the British free. and ultimately they did invade in 1812. Between the uh, or in the Canadians, between the British offering freedom to the slaves and the and the Spanish down in Florida offering freedom to the slaves, the Southern states felt somewhat squeezed. Would that be fair to say? I, I, I think it is. And, and what's interesting is, in, in the case of the British, the promise uh, was indeed kept that uh, the so-called black loyalists after the war uh, huh. were uh, able to leave North America, or uh, certainly leave the 13 colonies. Some of them went up to Canadian Maritimes. Uh, so, uh, sir, we're, we're, we're out of time. Hang on just a minute. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. I'm sorry, it's the tyranny of the clock here. Dr. Junius <laughs> Uh, P. Rodriguez, Professor of History at Eureka College. I've loved the conversation. The book, Encyclopedia of Slave Resistance and Rebellion. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, Tom.